Guy will be talking to us about meetings in reciprocity and the philosophy of education. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned in my ab abstract that this is the centennial of John Dewey's Democracy in Education. There was a big, big conference uh, in D.C. on that, on that topic, uh, a classic in philosophy of education. And it inspired me to do a paper uh, partly or heavily influenced by John Dewey. In his writings on philosophy of education, the pragmatist John Dewey supplies a very general aim for education and growth. But this is clearly an open-ended goal, and he refrains from and explicitly rejects argumentation aimed at determining an ultimate goal to which education is subordinate. Partly this rejection of efforts to hold educational curriculums hostage to externally determined goals, economic and state interests in the end use of education and of the workforce, may play some legitimate role, but this sort of reason cannot establish, indeed does not even address what goods are internal to the educational process. Whenever such a regime is in place, it's guided by assumptions far removed from Dewey's vision of democratic deliberation and of education for the whole person. Dewey's pragmatist conception of the value of education is experiential, and his approach to the norms concerning education, as with other social practices, is experimental. Dewey's rejection of ultimate aims goes further than this. He also rejects the idea that philosophers of, of education are in the business of seeking to determine an ultimate aim. In education, as in most other practices, Dewey holds that the ends are not fixed, but, quote, worked out and developed in the light of actual conditions. So he continues, the philosophy of education neither originates nor settles ends. It occupies an intermediate and instrumental or regular place. Philosophers, he certainly, uh, unquote, philosophers of, he certainly allow have an important role because, quote, ends actually reached, consequences that actually accrue, are to be surveyed and their values estimated in the light of a general scheme of values, unquote. Philosophers of education are concerned with values and aims, but what they ought not do is to conceive these as arrived at independent of context and determinable in a top-down, theory-driven manner. Dewey's rejection of context-independent final aims invites rather bottom-up, empirically grounded, deliberative process to guide educational practice and policy. This means following the example of the sciences and framing working hypotheses and testing and revising them. I'm uh, not reading the entire paper, but, but skipping ahead a little bit um, in some, some sections here, as it's rather long. But Quote, the entire popular notion of ideals is infected with this conception of some fixed end beyond activity at which we should aim. Uh, Dewey's naturalism leads him to deny that there are fixed ends either in nature or in the moral life. For example, quote, the utilitarian sets up pleasure as such an outside and beyond as something necessary to induce action and in which it terminates, end quote. The pausing of a human end or telos invites an impoverished conception of reason and rationality as the only, matter of, only a matter of choosing the best means for fulfilling that end. This suggests, quote, a theory of the external and coerced relationship of means and ends, one where when, one, when there is one thing that is a mean and another that is an end, there is nothing in common between them insofar as the one, the means, produces, and the other, the end, receives the product, unquote. Now this uh, view is plausible only if we assume that we can treat ends apart from the conditions of their actual existence, only if we can assume that this end and this end alone will be brought into existence and not a whole series of additional consequences. And this assumption, assumption is a mistake, Dewey holds. My choices in one social role or practice may affect another practice. Unintended and additional consequences often accompany the choice of means to promote an end in view. So by contrast to a dualism, the relationship of means and ends is a continuum, and as such requires more holistic evaluation. With the rejection of fixed ends, we can see that nothing really is an end or a means only. Ends in view, once realized, become means to new ends, and so on. Moreover, the means we choose recast the possibility of ends in view, limiting, expanding, or transforming them. Far from being of purely instrumental value and chosen only on the basis of simple expediency, means enter into and help determine the character of the ends for which they are chosen and they impact the legitimacy of those ends. Indeed, he wrote, the chief consideration in achieving concrete security of values lies in the perfecting of methods of action. This thesis of the reciprocity of means and ends informs Dewey's insistence that democratic ends require democratic means and that the ends of freedom and individuality for all can only be attained by means that accord with those ends. The attainment of democratic ends and the restriction to means that respect its core principles are, for Dewey, one and inseparable. 
Dewey's reflecting an idea he shared with his good friend Jane Addams, who wrote that, quote, social advance depends as much upon the process through which it is secured as upon the result itself, unquote. To return to the implications of means and reciprocity for debate over aims of education, I'd make two, note of two related uh, versions of externally supplied ultimate aims. The first is what Ian Kidd refers to as the per performative conception that prioritizes standardized examination for quantifiable qualities, such as grades and module pass rates, often to the exclusion of all else. The other is what he refers to as the instrumentalist conception of education, quote, that direct directs curricular content and pedagogic practice toward the training of the students with the skills and knowledge deemed necessary to national economic interests." Unquote. Now, Kidd notices that instrumentalism marginalizes virtue. Indeed, it's likely that not just certain philosophers, but supporters of the value of liberal education more generally oppose both the first view, which Atlee Harderson calls the technocratic view or the regime of standardization, and the second, which Michael Oakeshott refers to as service industry conception of education. In Why the Aims of Education Can't Be Settled, Harderson argues what I take to be a do in the Dewey vein that, quote, education is radically open-ended in the sense that although we can specify some of its purposes and make general statements to the fact that it aims at improvement or excellence of some sort, we cannot justify any definitive or exhaustive description of its purpose, unquote. He thinks the disagreement on how to describe the extension of education is to be expected as long as people disagree about what human excellence is to cultivate and which of them are enhanced by learning. Dewey would agree, but beyond these reasons for resisting talk of an ultimate aim, it's important to see that what Dewey does instead is to try to provide evaluative criteria for citizens themselves uh, to use in evaluating the educational value of practices and institutions. He emphasizes evaluative criteria suitable to progressive societies rather than analytic definition and determination of final ends. Growth is understood more in the sense of evaluation of learning. In the next section of this paper, uh, I try to triangulate the dispute among philosophers over the aims of education by taking into account the positions and arguments of proponents of character, education, and of critical thinking, or simply VT for virtue theory, and CT, as Harvey Siegel refers to the critical thinking aim. I want to emphasize the overlaps between Deweyans, contemporary virtue theorists, and Siegel, and not just the differences. For all three, again, pragmatists, VT, and CT, yeah. Education at every level ought to work to, de to develop and support students' ability to think for themselves. Supporters of critical thinking in public schools often call upon Dewey's work as a harbinger of the critical thinking movement in public schools. <coughs> From this perspective, <coughs> the differences between them is something of an in-house dispute. <coughs> While I'm suggesting they need not come apart in fundamental ways over the aims of education, in fact, judged by the current state of debate, they sometimes do. When they do, it's usually over very strong theory-driven claims made by proponents of CT or of character education. The one or the other should be taken as the more fundamental, again, the ultimate aim of education. To the extent that there are pro proponents of such claims, I, propose, uh, I suppose I'll have to pull out that beloved line of Duncan Pritchard and say that the devil is in the details. It, uh, it is primarily the, the practical details, including problems of identifying a core list of intellectual virtues and workable ways to assess them that will inform my criticism of the present call for character education to replace CT as we find in papers in a book by, by Jason Baer. <clears throat> On the other hand, pr primarily certain philosophical assumptions and starting points of, of Harvey Siegel's writing, a certain rationalism I deem untenable in his understanding of autonomy in particular, that will lead me to want to critique and to, to seek modifications in the approach to supporting critical thinker, CT, as an educational aim. <clears throat> and it doesn't want to switch. Oh, there we go, okay. Mm -hmm. I hope that's uh, big enough to see. So section two, there are many interesting overlaps between Dewey's pragmatic naturalism and some of the more naturalistic versions of virtue theory. His view that a genuine means is not merely an extrinsic causal condition, a coerced antecedent of the occurrence of a thing which is wanted, but an essential part of a consumatory experience, 
Ref, uh, this reflects the idea of goods internal to practice and the related point that on the Aristotelian view, virtuous dispositions are not merely instrumental to a flourishing life, but partly constitutive of it. In terms of Dewey's philosophy of education, this is, of course, reflected in one of his most famous statements, that education should be a process of living and not a preparation for future living. In his broader philosophy, Dewey constantly utilizes the term habit to describe naturalistically our human mode of being in the world, a focal term with obvious overlaps with trait terms like skills, aptitudes, dispositions, and virtues. His understanding of epistemology is in this way clearly agent rather than belief focused. There's quite a contingent of virtue theorists with explicit debts to classical pragmatism. We tend to understand the expansion of epistemology, the virtue, epistemo uh, virtue epistemology promises, as connected with Pragmatist's conception of epistemology as a theory of inquiry, rather than uh, uh, one uh, of one uh, 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 or another specific state or standing. I have sometimes drawn the distinction between Aristotelian or phronomic responsibilism after the phronomos, right? Uh, with its strong emphasis on internal motivations and zetetic responsibilism, focused instead on strategies of inquiry and with the collective improvement of inquiry. Lorraine Code, Kate Elgin, Susan Hack, Christopher Hookway, and Adam Morton are some of those I describe as responsibilists of this pragmatist sort. So my do, if I can put it that way, is partly a virtue theorist by virtue of his keen focus uh, on habits of inquiry and intimate connections between knowing and acting uh, uh, Incidentally, strong in Chinese thought, but far more tenuous in the West, where since early modern times we have bequeathed to ourselves what Dewey describes as a spectator theory of knowing. Dewey makes his position on final aims on, of practice, practices exceedingly clear in his strong ironic claim that while growth is a general aim or criterion of education, to make an end a final goal is but to arrest growth. Although there's always a disciplinary bias to think that what we teach is so important that it ought to be basic to all education, I think those like Jason Baer, who are strong promoters of character ed education, taking the driver's seat, so to speak, should consider closer the Dewey and skepticism about arguments in favor of ultimate aims. So we'll briefly touch upon the recent exchange between Baer and Siegel over whose program, uh, whose program deserves philosophically to be in the driver's seat as a prime example of a competition that Dewey would have us opt out of. I will maintain that Dewey's stance is a genuine and plausible third option. Philosophers must serve education when they take themselves to be purveyors of an account of an ultimate aim of education. Now this third option would be immediately undercut, I suppose, <clears throat> if there were no difference that makes a difference between Dewey's affirming growth as a general inclusive goal and his professed opposition to those who want to affirm a fundamental or, or final aim of education. But I've already discussed, A, differences between asserting open-ended goals and criterions from, from set or final goals, and B, how Harderson uses means and reciprocity, much like Dewey would argue that the aims of education should be thought of as remaining always open to revision. To add to this start, we can turn to a recent paper by Haji and Kuypers, 2011. These authors argue that while all philosophers of education try to balance some general, intermediate, and specific goals of education, the positive and ultimate aim by philosophers is different insofar as it's accompanied by certain specific and contentious argumentative strategies. After surveying uh, the history of such attempts to settle aims, Haji and Kuypers generalize that they typically employ one of two specific argumentative strategies. The first associates these aims with a normative standpoint, such as the moral, prudential, or aesthetic, which is overriding. The second associates education's ultimate aims with the intrinsic value of personal well-being. Now this is highly pertinent to my attempt to triangulate the debate because Siegel's transcendental or Kantian moral overriding this argument in his book Educating Reasons, an argument about the essential dignity of persons, is used by these authors to exemplify the first argument of strategy. And they identify the second strategy as generally eudaimonistic or Aristotelian, which of course fits Bear's personal worth argument for the value of the virtues by extension, uh, and by extension for character education. In discussion of the first, feature, uh, the first, they feature Siegel's arguments in defense of the claim that, quote, the fostering of rationality and critical thinking is the central aim and the overriding ideal of education, and again elsewhere, that critical thinking is, at a minimum, first among equals in the pantheon of educational ideals is rightfully seen more dramatically as the ultimate end of education, uh, unquote. These authors then submit to criticism these two strategies for establishing a final aim, containing that no version of these arguments for final aim of education has, at least as yet, made its case. Uh, 
While we might follow these authors along further, detail these argumentative strategies and the problems they find with them, I cannot do better than, that, than they've done, and so I prefer to return now to my project of triangulating the debate over aims. <clears throat> Now, one major attraction of virtue theory is the common ground that allows to be tilled between secular and religious thought. Socrates wanted us to talk about virtue every day as a means of self-knowledge, and I take eretaic concepts as vital to the mediating role which philosophy can pay, play between religious and secular society. Another attractive feature is the manner in which virtue theorists regularly propose and articulate new virtues as ways to address problems we t today face in our changing social and natural environment. The list of virtues for virtue responsibles is quite fluid, in positing, the positing of new virtues like epistemic justice and vices like epistemic injustice in recent years have been, and I suspect will continue to be at the forefront of the law of the best socially engaged philosophy. This is why virtue responsibilism has such strong and inviting connections with social and feminist epistemology and with deliberative democratic theory. It's also why responsibilists and reliableists can both draw from empirical work in the cognitive sciences in a way that help us control for implicit biases and other aspects of self-ignorance that empirical studies are revealing. But these two attractive features of contemporary virtue theory also appear to me to be problematic in regard to attempts to establish by philosophical argument that inculcating virtue should be front and center as the aim of education. I think of them as pulling in somewhat different directions. Historically, calls for character education have occurred in waves and not infrequently. <coughs> A common feature of these reform movements today has been their innate conservatism, as they are often, uh, so often a, a reflection of religiously based dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with public schooling and with science or liberal education curriculums in particular. Given especially the makeup of people working in the field of virtue epistemology, where a uh, majority of the leading authors are also, so, also self-described Christian philosophers, where the dominance of the Aristotelian models of virtue reflects this theological influence, it's not outlandish to suggest that the list of virtues promoted by proponents of character education and the specific thick descriptions provided for them might not be as religiously neutral as they appear when presented as philosophical research. Depending on the author's strikes me, it's very possible that the list and presentation of intellectual moral virtues are in fact thought of as subserving a list of traditional religious virtues, even if the latter are only mentioned explicitly in a smaller number of publications. This may be appropriate in private schools, again, countries which have no separation of church and state. But again, this is a point about how contextual the discussion over aim, uh, is the discussion over aims of education. I take it that the conversation among philosophers here is about public schools, about education in the context of a religiously neutral state-run system. In that context, my secularists worry about the new wave of calls for characterization, character education deserve to be taken seriously. Uh, this worry does not necessarily undercut uh, the call Jason, uh, Jason Baer and others make, but it's a consideration even when it's said to focus wholly around intellectual and more narrowly described epistemic virtues. Our Aristotelian responsibles, after all, are usually first to deny any very sharp differences between intellectual and moral virtue. On the other hand, the penchant for philosophers to posit new and improved virtues to address modern <laughs> conditions of life seems like an inherently more liberal application of virtue theory. But since I see this work functioning in a way akin to offering revisionary genealogies uh, of key philosophical concepts, I would describe it as primarily a contribution to social or political philosophy, and as such, uh, too contentious and constantly changing to be the focus of public education. Uh, these are some general initial reasons why I find myself agreeing with Siegel when he suggests we should be reticent to overthrow the well-established place of CT as an educational aim in favor of teaching for intellectual virtue. Let me be clear that my position is far from any claim that teaching for virtues isn't important or that there isn't a lot of good, work, good and valuable work going on in improving the assessment of efforts at character education. That fostering a wide range of intellectual virtues uh, would include, go well beyond the two components Siegel identifies with CT is not in dispute. What is more in dispute is the kind of claim Paul Thagard makes when he insists that our conception of CT uh, needs to be able to articulate a role for intellectual virtues without reducing them to dispositions to employ cogent arguments. I believe this is true and we'll further uh, speak to it further later, but the point here is that the wisdom of supplementing existing curricula and the wisdom of changing the focus or replacing substantial aspects of it are two different things. If nothing is lost, to supplement supplementation suggests, then I'm all in and indeed will suggest another sort of supplementation that I think CT courses should include in order to keep pace with psychological studies. But the debate over aims and, and, and the front seat, back seat metaphors suggest some sort of replacement. 
So the example, uh, so for example, the exchange between Siegel and Baer, to which I referred, uh, this is just a 2016 exchange, real, real fresh. Um, <clears throat> focus around Siegel's thesis that, quote, establishing the fostering of the intellectual virtues as a fundamental, edu as a fundamental educational goal is more ambitious and philosophically daunting than establishing the ideal of CT, unquote. What I found frustrating in reading the exchange between Siegel and Baer is how discussion of the appropriateness or inappropriateness of distinguishing sharply between reason uh, assessment skills and critical spirit components, uh, his two uh, components, RA and CS, reasons assessment and critical spirit, as Siegel wants, he wants a sharp distinction. And of the suitability of affirming the one goal and the ambitiousness of the other, slides ambiguously back and forth on part of both of these authors between A, demands on a philosophical account of agency, and B, practical demands on an educational institution to establish goals and outcomes, student progress towards which is readily accessible. With regard to purely philosophical questions, I expect there's little grounds for the sharp distinction between RA and CS. In the sense, at least, that most of the problems Siegel alleges with the opaqueness of the motivational and affective aspects of intellectual virtues are something of an illusion because most of these same problems would arise with its own critical spirit component to CT were one to open the hood and look closely within. But on practical grounds, grounds especially of establishing a set of outcomes with matching methods of measurement, we always want and need to be able to separate those factors that careful psychological research shows us can be separated. So it seems true that, as Bayer says, the possession of certain skills, abilities, competences is part of what it is to possess an intellectual virtue. But each of the three dimensions of virtue on Bayer's model, skills, proper motives, and proper judgment, he knows will still have to be separated for purposes of assessment with progress towards full virtue apparently inferred indirectly from some kind of on balance scoring of these. The point is that assessment is vital if intellectual virtues are to make their way more centrally into formal education aims. And starting top down from theory driven philosophical model like Bears of what the virtues are may be less practical than he seems to think. At least if I were to get on board the lobbying effort, I would need to be convinced of the accessibility of intellectual virtue in advance. I'm out of my depth on these subjects, but certainly glad to see epistemologists and psychologists in increasingly working on it in tandem. Uh, ben Coetzee and others are doing strong work in this area. But uh, Coetzee notes that teaching for intellectual virtue and assessment stand in a, quote, certain tension, unquote, and that the field of measuring virtue seems to be in its infancy. In the context of, of education, this testing is beset with imposing obstacles, not least of which are that it's hard to go beyond self-assessment for much of it, and that more objective measures may require longitudinal rather than latitudinal testing, perhaps over a longer period than the student attends school. So again, the debate that I'm dealing with in this paper on aims of education is one about whether virtues or CT, to use metaphors found in the literature, should take the front seat uh, in terms of actual formal advocacy for public schools, what I call the lobbying effort. And related to this, uh, whether such advocacy is aided or hindered by presenting one's views as an answer to a philosopher's question about the ultimate aim of education. For practical reasons of assessment, et cetera, I'm not convinced the character education movement is ready for that lobbying effort, but this remains consistent with saying that teachers can be as ambitious in their own teaching for intellectual virtues as they care to be, so long as they do not lose sight of institutionally accepted goals. To give a more specific example, Heather Baddeley identifies the concerns of critical thinking teachers to impart an understanding of how to evaluate deductive and inductive modes of reasoning as essentially reliableist concerns. I think I agree with her when she suggests that instructors can and should augment their ped pedagogy by teaching for responsibleist virtues in reliableist classrooms. In terms of the other question about ambitiousness of certain ph philosophers of education believing their business to propose and install an ultimate or final aim of, aim of education, my conclusion is the front seat, back seat metaphor is inapt. Remembering the intermediate or regulative role regular rather than principal role do we thought philosophers of education should limit themselves to. If we must speak of cars, it should be revisioned as one where a person would prefer to sit in the back, a limo perhaps, or to fit Dewey's uh, egalitarian le leanings, uh, a, a bus perhaps. Yeah. Okay, so that's my uh, second section. And uh, so the third is a critique of Harvey Siegel. So having reviewed the exchange between Siegel and Bear and responded to Bear 
Bear's proposals on practical grounds. Let me now move to a critique of Harvey's philosophical account of autonomy and rationality as they inform his general conception of epistemic normity and his specific conception of CT. While this paper defends CT as an important educational aim, the body of philosophy that Siegel uses to defend it, I want to argue, needs substantial reworking. I will organize this critique into three subsections. So the, uh, yeah, the first is individual autonomy and dependence. Siegel emphasizes that, quote, the educational ideal of rationality is aligned with the complementary ideal of autonomy, since a rational person will also be an autonomous one, capable of judging for herself the justifiedness of candidate beliefs and the legitimacy of candidate values. <clears throat> Let's start with some concerns about the ideal of individual autonomy itself. Emily Robertson's paper on the epistemic aims of education provides criticisms of Siegel's assimilation of rationality and autonomy. Drawing on work on epistemic dependence among social feminist and virtue epistemologists, she holds that the ed epistemic, educational aims, epistemic educational aims should acknowledge each individual's dependence on the knowledge of others. Uh, the independent thinker, even ideally, is not someone who works everything out for herself, and philosophers should not be committed to methodological individualism or to holding a view of rationality so abstract as to, quote, assume that there are no epistemologically relevant differences among knowers, unquote. I take it that the individual autonomy ideal uh, should be restric restricted to the simpler sense of Kant's famous sopera aude. Did I get that right? Uh, uh, on that, right? Challenge, close enough. Uh, Think for yourself. Critical thinking teachers should want to distinguish, as Kant did, between telling our students what to think and teaching them how to think for themselves. If the individual autonomy ideal is presented primarily with this limited connotation, uh, there's nothing objectionable. But to preface my second and third concerns, the fact of dependence to which contemporary epistemology is increasingly paying attention clearly carries with it a concern with existing and ideal epistemic practices. I don't see how this can be denied. You can't recognize the epistemological importance of dependence without taking the field of epistemologists intimately concerned with collective epistemic practices. <clears throat> so uh, second part, individual autonomy and the supposed autonomy of philosophy. These initial comments lead me to a second concern, that the conception of individual autonomy which Siegel employs appears to be reliant upon philosophy's autonomy in determining the content of norms for evaluating competence and performance. The Kantian approach to normativity has tended to take philosophy as the sole judge in normative matters and as the methodological authority which assigns the various domains of inquiry their proper questions. Philosophy self-image has too often been of an autonomous field separate from practice and dictating the correction of practice unidirectionally from objective standards to flawed practices and, uh, and thinkers in need of correction. This also gets us closer to key differences between rationalism and pragmatism. The history of, of Siegel's track of pragmatists includes some charges against him that he supposes dangerous dualisms and his equally sharp proposal that they espouse murky monisms. Uh, I must leave this for others to judge, but the one dichotomous distinction in Siegel's work that I want to argue is invidious and indicative and in inadequately naturalistic epistemology is his endorsement of a dichotomy between the context of discovery and the context of justification in science. In a paper reflecting assumptions I suspect continue to inform his understanding of epistemic normativity, he argues that Hans Reichenbach, 1951, was correct in holding that for purposes of epistemic assessment, epistemologists should work with a logical substitute rather than real processes. Uh, in this paper, Siegel himself goes on to argue, quote, that psychology cannot contribute to the evaluation of knowledge claims, end quote. None of the critics of the distinction of the context of discovery and justification have succeeded in showing that psychological investigation can contribute to the evaluation of knowledge claims. Uh, assumption of a fundamental cleavage between the rational and the social has often been grounds for accusing less rationalistic philosophers of psychologism. These charges were regularly leveled against pragmatists during the logical positivist era while the reverse charge was that these dichotomies were just the dogmas of positivist objectivism. Pragmatists, on my view, never confused the concern with actual practices with any decisionistic claim that actual practices determine standards. Fallibilism is arguably the birth child of pragmatists like C.S. Peirce, and I think it would have befuddled them to hear that the ability to identify errors of reasoning presuppose a dichotomy 
between logic and psychology. Of course, today we find naturalistically inclined epistemologists increasingly concerned with bridging the gap that this dichotomy imposed between philosophy and the empirical psychological sciences. This coincides with narrow, uh, rejecting narrow conceptions of philosophy as concerned only with justification, and of critical thinking as concerned only with teaching correct reasoning in the sense of formal modes of deductive and inductive inference. Work on bounded rationality, extending from the seminal work of Herbert Simon, asks and studies how real people make decisions with limited time, information, and computational powers. Working, work on ecological rationality goes together with studies of heuristic reasoning. We are all energy economizers and, and want to think fast and frugally, fitting strategies to mundane tasks the simplest way we can, rather than always doing the expensive reasoning of ideal qua unbounded reasoners. So Gerd Gigerenzer compellingly presents the facts of ecological rationality as challenging what he terms the classical conception of rationality, a conception with appealing but often unrealistic goals that he thinks is anti-naturalistic in its tenor, yet remains still deeply rooted in philosophy, economics, and decision theory. This account Gigerenzer blames for the institutionalized division of labor uh, between principles based upon the is and ought division. Quote, until recently, the study of cognitive heuristics has been seen as a solely descriptive enterprise, explaining how people actually make decisions. The study of logic probability, by contrast, has been seen as answering the normative question of how one should make decisions. The result is contrasting the, the pure and rational way people should reason with the dirty and irrational way people, in fact, do reason." Unquote. The idea that fast and frugal heuristic, heuristic reasoning can be ecologically rational when well suited to the problem situation, challenges expectations that human reasons are rational only or, or justified only when they meet normative standards derived independently of empirical and social psychology, independent practice, that is. Uh, that psychologists are showing human cognition to be so heavily ecological is one way of getting at the point that the norms of doxastic responsibility and rationality bump up against pragmatic constraints and inborn limitations in ways that challenge ideal observer and maximizing conceptions. The long-standing two cultures problem that prevents the closer integration of CT with empirical studies of moral and cognitive judgment is indeed based upon a dangerous dualism and as Peirce would say, a roadblock to inquiry. I had to get that in. Uh, on a pragmatist account, the implications of the normative descriptive distinctions adequately captured by everyday run-of-the-mill fallibilism, that is, recognition that norms are, well, normative, and that individuals can fail to meet them. It does not entail a doctrine of no traffic to and fro between descriptive and normative projects. When I use the term dichotomy, I mean that, that idea of, of, of no traffic. Uh, one way. Uh, I think of virtue theory and pragmatism as closely aligned on this crucial matter. And in agreement with Kwame Anthony Appiah when he writes, the questions we put to social scientists and physiologists are not normative questions, but their answers are not therefore irrelevant to normative questions. So Siegel is yet to speak today, and I'm, I'm working only from past papers of his I've seen. But when I say it, it seems to me that his accounts of autonomy and rationality need a reworking, I mean that I find them somewhat out of step with, with present naturalizing trends in the field of epistemology. And if I'm asked to accept his philosophical rationale for the CT platform, and the specific conception of the purview of, uh, of critical thinking, I, I need it to be more empirical, less rationalistic, more attentive to ecological rationality, and less dependent upon any view that would limit epistemic rationality to justification understood as a synchronic relation between a proposition and one's evidence that bears upon it. To reiterate Thagard's point, our CT curriculum and our understanding of intellectual virtues within that curriculum needs to address a whole lot more than a logical understanding of the structure of arguments, uh, which while of course not exclusively so, has been, been Siegel's central focus. <clears throat> Looks like I, I do have time to squeeze in my last section. <clears throat> I take these last points, to take these last points a bit further, <clears throat> my final comments on autonomy, I promise, can be put under the title, Between Autonomy and Automaticity. <clears throat> Dewey, has, Dewey was very interested, not just in formal reason, but in how we think. <clears throat> His account of habit is highly attentive to the philosophical importance of entrenched aspects of our cognitive architecture, as well as situational factors within our environment. Habit is the fixed routine of activity which normally <clears throat> predominates, often manifesting in behavior in which consciousness may play only a token role. He states that people often know more with their habits, not with their consciousness. <clears throat> 
action may take place with or without an end in view, and in the latter case, there's simply settled habits, something close to what psychologists call automaticity, in which dual process theory associates with fast and frugal T1 or system one, type one, system one processing. Though he doesn't have this language, Dewey says that in routine cases, quote, ends are determined by fixed habit in the force of circumstance. It's only if a problematic situation arises that the habit is disrupted and impulse proves inadequate, unquote. At this point, if we have the needed flexibility and metacognitive wherewithal, more effortful thinking intervenes to help resolve the problematic situation, or it does not, and the results like to be unsatisfactory. The adjustments are only successful as we have the flexibility of mind to apply a strategy of inquiry well adapted to the particular situation. Dewey bade us, quote, attend more fully to the concrete elements entering into the situation in which we have to act because it is impossible to reach the sort of adjustment save as a constant regard is had to the individual's own powers, tastes, and interests. Say that is, as education is continually converted into psychological or experiential term, terms. Uh, and I'll skip ahead. I did have a, uh, another little section there, but I'll skip ahead. To bring this discussion around to the aims of education, most critics of Siegel's two-component account of CT seem to want us to collapse this distinction. Uh, I would like to end by going in the other direction, suggesting that a better approach would be to add a third component to what we need to teach for it. Component addressed individual differences in what Keith Stanovich calls the thinking dispositions of fluid rationality. Those who do poorly on cognitive tests, it turns out, tend to be cognitive misers in the way that they process, while those who do better on, uh, than average exhibit a more desirable collaboration uh, between aspects of what Stanovich calls our crystallized and fluid rationality. I've got a slide here that... Uh, these are some of the books that I was using in these last two sections. Uh, Gerd Gagarin's Ecological Rationality, Keith Stanovich's Decision Making and Rationality in the Modern World, Adam Morton Bounded uh, Thinking, Intellectual Virtues for Limited Agents, and Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, here is a chart of uh, fluid rationality, uh, so you can get a, a better sense of some of the things that uh, Stanovich and dual process theories think it is involved in that. Thinking dispositions, in, in Stan, as in Stanovich's uses of the term, refer uh, not to what abilities and skills people have, but how disposed they are to use those abilities when need arises, and how sensitive they are to that need. So this further separation arguably helps to integrate an account of educational aims with the growing empirical literatures on metacognition. These traits might seem at first glance to fall Siegel's CS, critical spirit, but I don't think they fit uh, easily there because what they refer to are not just one standing dispositions like robust love of truth, or even on Bear's expanded list of time-honored, broadly-typed, responsibleist intellectual virtues. They are virtues, of course, but being mostly, as Adam Morton would call them, virtues of limitation management, they do not easily fit on lists of responsibleist virtues. My suggestion is intended, then, to add specificity to something mentioned in Coetzee's paper on assessment of virtues, that some empirical researchers have claimed there are really at least three empirically separable elements in play, specific ability, yeah, skills, and so inclinations, the motivational part, and sensitivity to reason in a certain way. The manner in which I take the sensitivity to reason in a certain way is in light of Co Daniel Kahneman's point that effective agency, both on heuristic tax and, and in the wild, must deal with, quote, the quirks of system one and the laziness of system two. I love it. Uh, uh, again, for assessment purposes, we should separate what we can separate, and my general standing love of truth doesn't indicate that I will demonstrate sustained de decoupling when that's needed. Neither does my knowing how to identify the, uh, and evaluate argument types. Here's a chart he uses on sustained decoupling, how it, uh, if it fails, you get the heuristic uh, uh, response. Uh, you, you fail to get uh, override, uh, sustained decoupling or override, uh, or, or you don't and finally get the type two response. This proposal, I think, is a useful supplement to our thinking about CT. 
And what I would hope students get from a CT curriculum, research shows that there are demonstrable differences in fluid, fluid rationality among individuals, differences that to a significant degree are attributable to education as they are not merely a matter of innate IQ. So when this third separable component is added to the purview of critical thinking uh, and assessment, we arguably achieve a substantially better balance of concern for the inner and the outer, the person and the situation, and of course, logic and psychology. Uh, in conclusion, I've argued what I think is a fairly common sense line. CT has been a, a backstay of liberal education for several decades and should continue to be such. But the underlying conception of rationality attending an account of the educational value of CT will also affect its pedagogy. Where this underlying conception of rationality leans upon a version of the old positivist dualism between epistemology and psychology, where it resists dealing with the messiness of things like biases and heuristics, ecological rationality, motivated inference, it needs to be revised to better accord with the emerging scientific image and with the broadening concern of philosophers for work in the special sciences. Pragmatism and virtue theory are two strongly overlapping approaches in philosophy, each with excellent resources for overcoming what I've called the two-culture two problem, resources to help them avoid dangerous dualisms without sinking into murky monisms. Pragmatism with its focus on habits and virtue theory on normatively valuable robust traits and, and dispositions. Both focus epistemology around agency rather than only around proposition, propositional attitudes. While for the most part highly complementary each to the other and to ideals of education for intellectual growth and independence, each in a different way helps to correct for conceptions of individual agency that neglect epistemic dependence and with it epistemic practice. Thank you.